This program is presented by University of California Television. Like what you learn? Visit our website or follow us on Facebook and Twitter to keep up with the latest UCTV programs. Also, make sure to check out and subscribe to our YouTube original channel, UCTV Prime, available only on YouTube. Hi, it's a pleasure to welcome Pam to Story Hour. Uh, Pam Houston was born and raised in Trenton, New Jersey. She received a BA from Denison University in Ohio and then rode a bicycle across Canada and to Colorado, where she worked at various jobs, among them bartender and flag woman on a highway crew. So as you can tell, she's kind of an adventurous person and certainly that's been borne out by the life she's led since. She's a licensed river guide, an accomplished horsewoman and a downhill skier and her travels have crisscrossed the globe. I first encountered Pam's fiction in the best American short stories of 1990 in the form of a story called How to Talk to a Hunter, which begins, when he says skins or blankets, it will take you a moment to realize that he's asking which you want to sleep under. I was captivated by that voice and so was the rest of the world two years later when Pam released a collection of linked short stories, including How to Talk to a Hunter, and that book was called Cowboys Are My Weakness. The Boston Globe wrote, Houston's voice is something new in fiction, bright, edgy, touching, and ruefully self-aware as she rewrites the old heterosexual blues. Her heroines are lean and tough, self-created adventurers. The San Francisco Chronicle described the stories as smart, sure-footed, full of humor, intelligence, and a kind of steely-eyed wonder. Since then, Pam has published another acclaimed collection of short stories, Waltzing the Cat, a novel titled Sighthound, and a collection of autobiographical essays called A Little More About Me. Her stories have been selected for volumes of Best American Short Stories, the, the O. Henry Awards, the Pushcart Prize, and the Best American Short Stories of the Century. She is the winner of the Western States Book Award, the Willa Award for Contemporary Fiction, and the Evil Companions Literary Award. Earlier this year, she published a new novel, Contents May Have Shifted. The novel, which is told in 144 sections, follows its protagonist, who coincidentally is named Pam, as she jets around the world, surviving near crashes and heartbreaks. Early in the book, the fictional Pam thinks, if I die tonight, it will be with every single thing unfinished, like, I suppose, every, any other night. And yet, what a gift to, to die on the verge of tears. I've spent my life trying to understand the way this rock and this ache go together, why my best days and my worst days are always the same days. The San Francisco Chronicle wrote, Houston is a wonderful writer and her graceful vignettes are by turns beautiful, slyly funny, and heart-stopping. She observes with sharp insight how we live with the choices we make. She's currently the Director of Creative Writing at UC Davis and teaches in the Pacific University Low Residency MFA program. She lives on a ranch at 9,000 feet in Colorado. Please join me in welcoming Pam Houston. Thank you, Vikram, and uh, thank you all for coming. It's lovely to read at Berkeley. I don't think I ever have. Um, I've certainly never had a parking space like I just got. <laughs> I know that for sure. Um, and if I did read at Berkeley, it was so long ago, it's lovely to be back. Um, I, I tweeted that um, I promised to get everybody home for the first pitch. Uh, so um, I won't be reading too long this evening, but uh, thank you for coming. And um, this book, Contents May Have Shifted, was born when I went to the Wisconsin Book Festival. I was invited to the Wisconsin Book Festival and I was asked to participate in an evening called Unveiled, where uh, four writers were asked to read work that was completely untested and untried. And I took that assignment so seriously that I didn't start writing until I was on the plane to Wisconsin and 
had about had the whole plane time, which took all day, of course, and then about 48 hours after I got there to write something that I would read that night. And um, I was a little panicked about that. And in my panic, I, I did what I tell my students to do, which is when they're stuck or claim writer's block or whatever, which was just think of the things out in the world that, that glimmered at them lately, I, I, that, that arrested their attention, that said, you know, hey, writer, over here. And, and um, so I just picked, I just went back through my recent memory and picked 12 very short mini scenes, kind of these glimmering objects. Uh, and because I move around a lot, one of them was from Gulfport, Mississippi, and one of them was from Davis, and one of them was from Juneau, Alaska, and one of them was from Ozona, Texas, the places I had been and things that stood out for me there. And I, I wrote them, and just before I, I, and I stayed up all night, you know, which is what I do, but I stayed up all night and tried to make them better and, and uh, you know, thought, well, I won't connect them. I'll just leave them discreet from each other and just let them bounce off each other kind of imagistically and metaphorically. And, um, and I thought, well, I better just check the email to make sure I did everything I was supposed to do. And so I looked at the email and I was right, you know, what it had asked for and the amount of time and so forth. But then it said, the only caveat is that you have to mention the state of Wisconsin. <laughs> and uh, so I, and I, because I had barely ever been to Wisconsin. And um, so I had to take one out. I had to take out the goosenecks of the San Juan River, which was the longest one anyway, and it didn't quite fit with the others. And I went downstairs and sat on the street corner in Madison, Wisconsin, and waited for something to happen. And, um, <laughs> and after a little while, it did. And I, uh, and I came back up and wrote it. And then I had my 12. And I read it that night. And a writer that I have always admired very much, Richard Bausch, and a friend, was there. And he came up to me after the reading. And he said, write 100 of those, and that's your next book which was nothing I had thought. You know, I was really just trying to meet an assignment deadline and not embarrass myself. But in a certain way, all of my books and all of my writing is kind of created that way from these little moments, these little glimmers. And so, so because I've always uh, liked 12s and not 10s, I thought, well, not 100, but 144. So, um, so that's how this book was born. And then six years later, uh, it was finished, and um, it took a long time. It took even a little longer than usual, mostly because because I was having so much fun moving the pieces around. <laughs> I had 144 pieces, and every time I sh moved one, it changed the whole meaning of everything. And honestly, like I could have done that for the rest of my life and been happy. And um, but eventually, you know, I had to make a balloon mortgage payment, so um, so I stopped. Um, but okay, so so 132 of the stories take place someplace, and they're named for that place. And 12 of them, every 12th one, takes place on an airplane, or in other words, no place. And so I'll start out with an airplane story. Um, they are named for the the flight number. So I'll start out with an airplane story, and then read some some of the others. This is Delta 55. The plane is gradually but perceptibly descending. It is barely light outside, and we aren't due at Orly until nearly noon. There is an odd ticking noise coming from the wing outside my window. I come fully awake and realize we are listing strenuously to the right. I glance at my seatmate on the aisle. Her name is Rebecca. She is a 26-year-old bank teller from Cincinnati who has never flown before, who has saved for five years to take her dream trip to Paris. I spent most of dinner telling her how much safer airplanes are than car travel, how the 777 has a minimum of three fail-safes on each of its major systems, how even if one of the engines fell clean off the fuselage, it is designed to tumble backwards up and over the wing so it doesn't tear the wing from the plane. Now, in spite of all my reassurances, we seem to be heading shoulder first into the North Atlantic. Ladies and gentlemen, the pilot says, as many of you are probably aware, we are descending 
preparing to make an unscheduled landing into Reykjavik, Iceland. Approximately 35 minutes ago, we experienced an explosion in our number two engine, and that engine is now inoperable. The ticking sound you hear is the wind running through it, spinning the blades backwards, much like a household fan. You can probably also tell that we are tacking toward Iceland as we would in a sailboat, as our current engine configuration will not give us full power in a straight line. Now Rebecca is awake and looking at me wild-eyed. The man likes a metaphor, I say, and offer a small smile. The light out the window has strengthened, and I can see white caps on an angry gray sea. I always kind of wanted to go to Iceland, I say, but by now Rebecca is no longer looking at me. She has her eyes closed tightly, has given herself, I imagine, to prayer. We will be landing in approximately 15 minutes, the captain says. Please give your undivided attention to the flight attendants as they instruct you in landing in the brace position. I like that he did not say crash. I like that he's a language guy. The ocean is getting quite a bit closer, no sign of Iceland out my window, and I hope that Reykjavik Airport does not turn out to be a metaphor for f just when it seems that our wheels have to be skimming the water, land and runway lights appear, and then more of them. So many lights it is hard to count them. A sea of spinning red and blue. Every ambulance and fire truck in Iceland seems to have come out to greet us. Holy cow, I say, just before the wheels hit the foam and the foam splashes up and covers all the windows, throwing the cabin in a half light exactly like waking up in a tent after a snowstorm. And then everyone is cheering as the plane glides to a jerky, sticky stop. Much later, in an upstairs blank space of terminal, as we are being fed rice with some kind of yellow chickeny goo all over it by something resembling the Icelandic Red Cross, the crew tells us the reason for the emergency equipment. When the number two engine exploded, it spit jet fuel all over the fuselage. We were a Molotov cocktail hurtling through space, is the way the literary pilot puts it. There was no way to be certain that the friction of the tires on the runway wouldn't make a spark and ignite us, turn us into a 90 mile per hour ball of flame. This is Banzang High, Laos. My guide Zai and I are standing in the warm mist of a Mekong River morning in the village of Banzang High, Laos watching an unusually tall Laotian tend his boiling vats of Lao Lao, the rice wine moonshine that has put his village on the map. Monkeys scream in the trees above us, and a gentle-faced woman stands nearby, holding a glass I fear is meant for me. It is slightly after 8 a.m., and in America, that would be good enough reason to decline politely. But here in Laos, where decorum is far more rigorous and complicated than it is in America. I'm pretty sure there isn't going to be a way out of drinking the pickled Mekong water that is about to come from the steaming, rusted 50-gallon drum. I reassure myself that no self-respecting amoeba could possibly live in 80-proof hooch and quickly down the glass of white I am offered, which gets me another glass, and then a glass of red, which I realize the second it goes down my throat without searing my tonsils isn't nearly as strong as the white. I am seized with regret, flooded by premonitions of vomiting in a Laotian healthcare facility. <laughs> I do what any sophisticated world traveler would do and stuff an entire antibacterial wipe into my mouth. <laughs> and during the tour of the brightly painted temple, suck every drop of juice out of it I can and swallow. Outside the temple, a beautiful woman is making ferns and bougainvillea and daisy petals out of colored paper. I buy a small bouquet from her and ask if I can take her picture. She says something to Zai and he translates. She says she should take your picture because you are the beautiful one. And I can tell by the tone in his voice that he thinks she is mistaken. Zai is the most formal guide I have ever had in Asia, which is saying a great deal. He had been a monk for three months at 18, then he became one again for one day last year when his mother died, so he could carry her body, he says, to the other side. His English is impeccable, except that he says electric city when he means electricity, 
and comfort table when he means comfortable, and anyone can see why he would think that was correct. At least twice a day, he says, if I am not speaking right, you will please graduate me, but I rarely do. I'm pretty sure I have managed to eat the antibacterial wipe clandestinely until we are back on the boat heading downriver to the magical city of Luang Prabang when Zai says, have I told you yet how the Buddha died? When I say no, he says, he was invited to the house of a friend for dinner and they were serving pak. Pak, I say. Pak, pak, he says, mildly impatient with me as usual, and he makes an oinking noise in his throat. Ah, I say, and Zai smiles. He knew the pak was bad, Zai says, knew even that it would kill him, but he ate it anyway because it was most important not to offend his hosts. I guess that's the difference, I almost say, between Buddha and me. But on the off chance that Zai has paid me a compliment, I smile out at the muddy river and nod. This is 59, Tucson, Arizona. I have not been on the property 30 minutes when I am lying on a massage table in a softly lit Frangipani scented room with a person named Trevor towering over me. I can see, Trevor says, that you are doing a lot of spiritual work because look how far you are out in your hair. His accent is vaguely South African and he has the most impressive unibrow I have ever seen. I do not read poetry, Trevor says, because I live poetry. <laughs> he picks my feet up and lets them fall back to the table. May I ask you, he says, why the lower half of your body is perpetually standing in ice cold water? He means energetically, of course, because the room is warm and my legs are dry. And what happened here, he asks, not waiting for an answer. He has his hand on my leg at the exact place where, when I was four years old, my father threw me so hard against a big oak wardrobe that I broke my femur. The bone healed 40 years ago. I was casted from the tip of my toes to my armpits for months, but Trevor is not the first healer to be able to see what happened. My father, I begin. I am not afraid of your pain, Trevor says. I am not afraid of your grief. I am not afraid of your terror. You want to know why I'm not afraid of your terror? I nod. I am not afraid of your terror because I have gone inside the monster, and inside the monster is pure wonder. Somewhere in this building, my friend Willow, who I have come to Canyon Ranch with, is getting a nice, simple lavender scrub and an herbal wrap. Willow looked through the catalog, thought, yes, the first night, maybe a nice herbal wrap after all that travel. Pamela, Trevor says, will you tell me your father's name so that I may ask him to excuse himself from the lower half of your body? Yes, I say, and I do. Sebastian, Trevor says, Sebastian, you must get out of there. Sebastian, he says, it does not belong to you. He has his eyes closed and his hands tight around my ankles. No, Sebastian, he says more forcefully now, there are no options. We stay like that for an excruciating amount of time. Then he folds my hands across my chest and covers them with his. If you could have only one thing, he says, would you choose peace or ecstasy? Ecstasy, I think, though I'm pretty sure I'm supposed to say peace. <laughs> Peace is an illusion, Trevor says. I am in the ecstasy nearly all the time now, even when I sleep. I think of the composer's lonely bedroom, the terrible black sheets, the clock radio projecting blood red digits onto the ceiling, his bald head a glinting Cabernet color like someone already dead. Pamela, Trevor says, slapping the bottom of my feet with his palms. Yes, sir, I say out of habit. He's got my wrists now, is stretching them back over my head. No one has ever called me Pamela except my father. You have two glasses, Trevor says. One is completely full and one is completely empty. In which glass is stillness possible? The full one, I say. The questions are getting easier. Trevor now has his powerful thumbs wrapped almost completely around my uppermost vertebra. You can get to stillness through ecstasy, he says, but you can't get to ecstasy through stillness. I think about all the ways the language of the New Age is custom made for terrorism. I think about when a pink mouth opened in a white sky over Davis and I saw for the second time the cupped waiting hands. 
When one of the doing lines in your life intersects with the circle of your now, Trevor says, what happens? It has to bend, I say, confident. It bends and bends and eventually becomes a circle. Precisely, he says, and releases his death grip on my neck. This is Drigung, Tibet. Shring and Haley and I follow an old llama to the top of a bald hill above the monastery in the cool morning air. We have been told there will be three corpses, a man, a woman, and a child, and that they are unrelated, though they appear to us like a little family laid out on the platform, wrapped in their cotton shrouds. We are very lucky, Shring says, many corpses today. When he says corpse, it sounds like cops, as in pines. The man who will prepare the bodies arrives and begins to unwrap the first corpse. A little ways up the hill, roughly a hundred vultures jockey for position against a rope held in place by family members of the deceased. They are wild birds, but Drigung is the most accessible monastery practicing sky burials. The birds know to come at 11 for their almost daily feed. Shring told us the bodies would be quartered, but the word filleted is the one that jumps to mind. He explains that the man with the big knife will make four incisions, one around the chin, one down the center of the torso, and two at a diagonal down the shoulder blades. They pull the skin off the bones, he says, because if they don't give the vultures the bones first, they sometimes eat the flesh and leave the bones, and then the whole person doesn't ascend together, and there is more work for the butchers to pound the bones into pulp. He hesitates enough over the word butcher that I know he is not quite happy with it, but he doesn't know a better one. These men, he says, that do the cutting, they are not allowed to marry. Their karma is very bad. Same with the men who butcher animals. Do you mean this job is punishment for their last life, I ask him? or that they will be punished for this job in the next life. Yes, he says, also jewelers. It is the same. <laughs> jewelers, I say, why? It is just what we believe, he tells me. Is it because they are wealthy, I say? It is just what we believe, he says again. All three bodies are cut into pieces, and I miss whatever sign the llama gives to the men who have been holding the rope. When the vultures run in, the smell takes up all the air on the mountaintop. And as they rush past me, I can see they are huge birds, each of them half the size of a man. There is squawking and shrieking. Several birds go after one femur. Another makes off with a forearm, the hand with all the flesh still on it bouncing along the stones at my feet. No fewer than six birds are pulling in different directions on a skull that is still attached to a spine that is still attached to one leg and the skull is laughing. The old llama plays tug of war with a vulture over a leg bone, and when he wins, he lifts another vulture, this one nearly featherless, out of the melee and gives him what is left of the bone. That is a sick one, Shring says. Every so often, the butcher picks up an especially aggressive vulture by its head and hauls it off to the side. When there is nothing left but skulls and pelvises, the butcher steps back in and pounds the big bones into pulp with a giant mallet. Bone pulp flies all over the place, and a huge wad of it lands on Shring's arm. In seconds, a member of the family of the deceased comes over with a little bottle of alcohol and wipes it clean for him. His preparedness makes me realize this must happen all the time. Shring smiles at the man out from under his Scooby-Doo hat. On the walk back down the hill, Shring says, when I see a sky burial, all desire to have money and get more things goes away. Because you see a man, and then you see him dead in a ball, and then you see him cut to pieces, and in 20 minutes he is nothing. It is like he never existed. Shring picks sage so that we can burn it in the little stupa back at the monastery. When we get there, he shows me how to stick my whole upper body in so that I won't take the bad dead people luck with me back into the world. When I can't see or breathe anymore, I pull my head out, but Den Zing grabs me by the scruff of the neck and pushes me back in. It is very unusual, Shring says, when Den Zing finally turns me loose. A Westerner, here at this ceremony, Den Zing is afraid that now the car will crash. 
Denzing holds Haley in the stupa so long, I think she will surely asphyxiate. When he finally lets her out, he talks with urgency for several minutes to Shring in Tibetan, and when he's finished, we ask what he said. Shring thinks a long time and says, Denzing says it is good to be happy all the time. Really, Haley says, all those words? And Shring says, after a pause, he says it is sometimes also good to be sad. This is 71, Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Driving from Chicago in the minus six degree weather, neck craned out the window looking for the lunar eclipse because the rocket scientists told me to. But the light pollution extends all the way to the Wisconsin border and I think I'm probably facing the wrong direction anyhow. If I became the rocket scientist's girlfriend, the fortune cookie about me being the reasonable one would never, ever, ever be true. In Milwaukee, everything is frozen solid. The river, the stoplights, even my car door. But when I get to my high-rise hotel room, there is the eclipse right out my window, halfway over and looking strange enough to scare a caveman or an ancient Egyptian to death. Trish comes to meet me for breakfast with her sperm bank in vitro baby, and I have no idea how to respond as she details all the ways her life has become a living hell. <laughs> She knows I thought she was crazy to do it at her age, alone with her 80 hour a week job, and now here she is as if to prove me wrong, but everything she says makes her life sound about 10 times worse than I could have ever imagined. The lake is frozen as far out as you can see, blocks of ice heaved up on the shore like wrecked cars, and Cliff Parker, whose law firm is sponsoring my visit, picks me up and takes me to the Milwaukee Country Club for lunch. It is so much like the country club in Bethlehem, Pennsylvania that my father could just barely afford to belong to, it takes my breath away. Only it is like it is still 1972 in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. The white wallpaper with little parasol toting maidens doing tour jetés across it. The four dead gray haired ladies propped up in the corner as if to look like they're playing bridge. The place probably seats 250, not even counting the no women allowed grill downstairs. And yet other than the dead ladies in the corner, we are the only ones eating today. The point of this luncheon, I quickly understand, is so that Cliff can show me why he is a lawyer and not a writer, to show me the kind of life he gave up writing for. He has invited eight people to the luncheon beside the two of us, and exactly none of them show up. I can't decide if Cliff Parker is a sociopath or just so completely normal that he's incomprehensible to me. <laughs> Our waitress is actually named Trudy. She has a beehive hairdo and is at least 114 years old. We both order the Cobb salad, and for some inexplicable reason, it takes 45 minutes to arrive. The room is being heated to a sultry 85 degrees, and there is a squirrel hurling himself repeatedly at the floor to ceiling window behind Cliff's head. Over and over, he climbs the nearest tree and then flies, flying squirrel style, and lands splat with his face against the window where his paws achieve suction for a little more than one second before he slides like a cartoon character down to the bottom of the glass. He does this five or six times before I comment on it, though it makes such a terrible noise every time he hits, I can't believe Cliff doesn't turn around. <laughs> Probably rabid, Cliff says, with a casual wave of his hand, and I feel my eyebrows go up, and he says, a lot of the squirrels around here are. <laughs> this is 80, Portland, Oregon. Rick says, Pam, if everyone deserved a down pillow, there wouldn't be any more birds. This is 111. <laughs> Trenton, New Jersey. <laughs> Let's say, for the sake of argument, that my back hurts so much because when I was four and in my three-quarter body cast, my mother found it easiest to carry me around upside down like a monkey, using the plaster bar the doctors had fashioned between my knees to keep them for three and a half months, the correct distance apart. And let's say she did just that, until my second to last appointment when the orthopedic surgeon said, you haven't been carrying her around by this bar, have you? 
And my mother shot one quick glance at my father and said, of course not, no. And it became a funny story the two of them liked to tell together to friends over a couple of drinks. And let's say that when their friends asked, as of course they would, how in the name of heaven a four-year-old breaks her femur, they said that I had somehow managed to pull the giant wardrobe over onto myself, except instead of wardrobe, they would have said credenza, because it would have made us sound richer than we were. I still don't see how it would make me feel any better to think of the pain in my hip and spine as anything other than my most loyal and valuable companion, the continuous non-voice in my ear that says, you got out alive and you still get to go. No two people who have ever lived love to travel more than my mother and father. They gave that love in their fashion to me. And I will close with Istanbul, Turkey, a place I love and got to go back to this summer, briefly, with a broken leg, but still, it was good. <laughs> <laughs> At the Sultan's palace, beautiful long-limbed girl, sexy but not too sexy, lots of brassy hair surrounded by seven or eight international travelers her age. To an Australian boy with acne scars, she says, you are walking through the Topkapi Palace with three beautiful women, what more do you want? The other young women are not in the same room of beautiful as she, but they accept the compliment, don't dare to interrupt. The boy says, maybe if you were all naked, and laughs. One of the other girls, a Swede, says, no, meaning, go fuck yourself, acne face. The brassy-haired girl holds her fingers to the Swede's lips, says, my parents taught me never to say no immediately. To men, the Swede asks. To anything, she says. Istanbul is the only major city in the world that is situated on two continents. Since 330 AD, it has been the capital of the Roman Empire, the Byzantine Empire, the Latin Empire, and as recently as 1922, the Ottoman Empire. In the hilly streets, ruin leans into palace, leans into internet cafe. We are in line waiting to get into the harem. Miles of tiled, low-lit corridors and rooms so thick with ghosts of women in captivity you can feel their hair on your arm, their jasmine-scented breath on your face. In contemporary Istanbul, the dervishes have finally invited the women to whirl. In the Blue Mosque, there are 250,000 tiles the color of sky. When the sun comes out, inside is sky and outside is golden. I am 46 years old and ashamed of the fact that this is the first mosque of my life. But later, when the evening call to prayer catches me in the garden between the Blue Mosque and the Hagia Sophia, call and echo, echo and answer, bouncing off domes and turrets that have stood on this hill for 1,500 years, I know faith springs out of doubt like topsoil, and one thing I am is here right now. Across the golden horn where the Bosphorus meets the Sea of Marmara, the Asian part of the city glistens in the twilight. As a candidate for the center of everything, Istanbul beats Pueblo, Colorado, hands down. The gulls are turning cartwheels around the towers of the Blue Mosque and cawing like crazy women. Byzantium, I say to them. Constantinople. The circle of my now is wreaking havoc with the lines of my doing. I am learning to say yes, if not always immediately. A sweet-faced Turkish boy, maybe 19, offers me a Kleenex, puts both hands over his heart when I take it, says I look just like his mother when I cry. Thank you. Can I do questions? Yes, yes. <laughs> yes, yes, they want me to do questions. Um, I'm happy to answer some questions if there are any. Out of curiosity. Yes. Um, the sky burial, is that something you actually saw? It was, yeah. And how did you come to be there? Um, I, you know, I, I've been lucky because I, I wrote... Um, I wrote travel for a while for some of the national magazines, and 
um, you get to be known in a certain way is all the way to say it. And I and so the travel agent that I continue to use that that I originally used with those magazines, you know, knows how to get people into places. Although I understand, I mean, this was years ago, ten years ago now that I went to Tibet, I guess. But um, I understand it's more it's more common now. It's not as hard as it used to be to to get into one of those. When when we were there, we were the only. Uh, Westerners, and it was a big deal, like, as, you know, for our driver, and it was not, you know, it was all decided somewhere other than with them, and then they were, I mean, they liked us pretty well, but still, like, they were like, it wasn't, you know, it was not without its worrisome moments that we had been invited. Yeah. It's just kind of random, but... I mean, I'm just so curious how you managed to live on a ranch in Colorado, and yet also you're the creative director at, at UC Davis. How do you do that? Well, um, I, a lot of really good ranch sitters. <laughs> um, and, you know, I, I, I keep, um, I'm going to give up the directorship really soon. I, I keep saying that. Uh, and, and I keep getting talked into keeping it, but, but I need to give, I mean, I, anyway. Uh, you know, email, um, airplanes, you know, a lot of driving. And, and also, I, you know, there's big chunks of time I just can't be at the ranch. And so I have, um, you know, I have people who are eager to go there and write a book or go there and hang out for a while and watch over things. It's not like a working ranch or anything. It's, it's uh, I have a, a couple of elderly horses and some sheep and some chickens. <laughs> um, but it's not like, you know, there's not cattle or anything. <laughs> yes? Are there prose models for your book that you just yeah, um, I mean, not not precise. Um, I, a couple books that I read as I was getting ready to write this or as I was starting um, were uh, Nick Flynn's The Ticking is the Bomb and Mark Doty's Dog Years. Those are both memoirs, um, but they are prose models. They're, they're told in very short pieces um, that do not necessarily follow each other logically or chronologically. And those two books, I loved both of those books very much, and, and I know that they influenced this. Um, uh, you know, there are a lot of writers writing, I'm forgetting something really obvious that I also read around this time. But, but you know, uh, the novel Florida uh, by Christina Schutt, Schutt, I think is how you say her name. I didn't actually love that book, but I liked it pretty well. And it's it's a novel written in very small pieces. Um, but but really, you know, the 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 truer way to say it is that this is how I I've written everything, and then I've pulled and stretched and elongated and make made it seem chronological or logical or both. And this time, I just thought, well, you know, what if I just got in and got out and left them discreet because in in a sense like this is this is what I'm most inclined to do because I I'm just so much more thrilled with associative resonance than I am with logic or linear but I'm I'm working up to a, a new project and I'm I feel like I, I sort of want to challenge myself to be as linear as I absolutely can just to see because my books have gotten more this way like you know, and so maybe I've exhausted this now, and maybe it's time to do something really new. But, but it, it's it's my natural way of, of, of observing the world and taking little pieces and bringing them together to see what they make together. It I don't ever say, oh, I'm going to write a story and this is going to be the storyline, or this is going to be the plot, or this is going to be the arc, or I, I'm thinking of a character. Like, that never happens to me. It's always these observations pulled in and combined. So it's a kind of a natural way for me to, to make a book. Um, and it was really fun. Like, I felt, like, the whole time it was fun, which has never really happened with a book. <laughs> Dog ears, uh huh. The ticking is the bomb. Nick Flynn's uh, book and Mark Doty is the other author. 
And again, those are both memoirs. Um, so there's that. <laughs> uh -huh. On form still. So on the back it says fiction. <laughs> on the front it says a novel. <laughs> How did you choose or why did you choose to name your favorite, the main character Pamela? Mm -hmm. Um, you know, the, th the funny thing about this, like I could tell two different stories, I guess I will, because one's really short. We didn't know, when I say we, I mean sort of my editor and I, like the question of whether we were going to call this a memoir or a novel was open, like right till the last minute. And it really had more to do with what was going on in the world, and the literary world, and, you know, John Degatta, and et cetera, et cetera. David Shields and, you know, then, then my hopes for the book or my agenda. The truth is I, I didn't have an agenda. Like I, this is how I make books, you know, or how I have in the past, you know, I, uh, and so, so for me, I don't, I don't a hundred percent believe in something called creative nonfiction. You know, I, um, I, I go to an accountant called creative accounting and everybody knows what that means. You know, I, um, like I don't, you know, I, I, I don't believe that language can mean um, precisely or 100%. And I, and I don't quite believe that memory is infallible. And I don't believe that, that our, all our desires about how we wish we acted or how, what we wish we'd said get in the way between the event and the pen. So, so I, I, I wrote an essay about this called Corn Maze, which, which is really sort of me taking my stand on this subject. But, but, but in short, my, my project has always been to, to, to be like Henry James, to become a person for whom you know, nothing is lost, pay really strict attention, bring it back, and shape it. And in that shaping, things change. You know, reality shifts, contents shift somewhat. Um, and so for that reason, it's perfectly fine with me to call it fiction. Because so far, there's no law against autobiographical fiction. There is only a law against nonfiction where you make things up. So, um, so, so I sort of thought we would call this fiction, and we ended up doing it. But for a long time, we weren't going to put anything on the cover. We were going to make it like The Things They Carried, which in certain ways this book is kind of an homage to, because that book was so important to me when I was a young person, by Tim O'Brien. If you don't know it, of course you know it. Um, and that book doesn't say anything on it anywhere. It's, it's shelved in fiction, but it doesn't say fiction or a novel. And, and that was what I was hoping for. But then these are how these decisions get made. They showed me this cover, which I liked a lot, but it didn't have this little cloud on it. So it was just this cover with the plane, the steps going to no plane. Oh, sorry. The steps, it's just steps going into a blue sky and no airplane. It's plane steps with no airplane. And I thought, yeah, that's really smart. Like whoever read the book, you know, got it. And I felt good about that. You always take a terrible deep breath when a book cover comes. Um, and, but I, I thought it was a little cold, frankly. Like I thought it was a little too ironic for what I'm after in this book. Um, and so then they thought about it, and oh, they put a prayer flag on the, you know, they did some things. But, and we didn't like any of them. And then they sent this little cloud in the shape of a heart. And I thought, OK, <laughs> but that's a little too far the other way. Like, that's a little sentimental, isn't it? You know, I have a cowboy hat on one book. I have a heart on the other. Like, that doesn't thrill me. But then we thought if we used the heart to say a novel, to say the words a novel, the heart was doing something and was therefore less sentimental. And so in a certain way, it was a decision that had nothing to do with Oprah, you know, or John Degatta, or any of that, Jim Fry. I was Jim Fry's first writing teacher, I'll just say that. It's true, it's true. I was his first and only writing teacher, which I didn't know until he posted it on my Facebook page recently that I was his only writing teacher. I did not know that. I knew I was his first. Um, just that's the guy who wrote A Million Little Pieces, James Fry, who got in trouble with Oprah um, <laughs> for lying. <laughs> um, because what Oprah wanted to say, she wanted to say, you lied to the American people, to George Bush. But she made a mistake and said it to Jim Fry. And then a lot of things happened after that. And we're all you know, paranoid freaks now as a result. 
Um, but anyway, so that's, <laughs> that's, that's the short version of all of that. Um, and so, so it's, it's fine with me. I, I feel that I am a fiction writer. I feel that I'm a writer of usually autobiographical fiction. And so it's fine with me to call it fiction. And that seems truer because I did, you know, when I really look at it line by line and if like, if I were taking a lie detector test, there's all kinds of little minute changes. Just the kind that John Degata talks about in the fact of a doorframe, you know, like, or the, the lifespan of fact. Um, you know, like, well, you say that there's 31 casinos instead of 33 because 31 sounds so much prettier in your mouth. Like, there's all kinds of those changes in here. Um, but was this essentially my experience? Did I go to these places? Yes. Yeah. Did, have I been in crash position on a commercial airline seven times? Yes. Oh. <laughs> True. Weird. No, see, that, no, see this, that's, that's what people say. People say, we won't fly with you, but you should fly with me because like, think how good my odds are. Like, not only of it not happening again, but of surviving if it does. Like, I have like an incredible record. On the phone, twice. <laughs> One more? Yeah. Yes, sure. Um, I just read Canada this weekend, Richard Ford's new book, and um, or not so new anymore, but um, Rock Springs certainly was a huge influence. Laurie Moore was a massive influence for me. I was actually, when I wrote How to Talk to a Hunter, the story that shockingly launched my career, I was just ripping off Laurie Moore. I was in graduate school. I was a grad student, and our professors said, emulate someone you admire. And Self Help had just come out, which is her first book. I think it's her first book. I'm not positive about that. But it was an early book for her. And it had all these how-to stories, how to be a writer, how to talk to your mother, how to be the other woman. So I, so I just wrote how to talk to a hunter. I was just doing a, I was just writing a Lori Moore story. And um, you know, I, this, I, sometimes when I go to a university to visit to teach, I will, will talk about that. And the students always say, oh, your story is nothing like hers. And, and I say, well, thanks, you know, that's nice of you, but in fact, <laughs> I was trying to make it like hers. So, um, so Laurie Moore was, was very influential. Um, I, I, I was at Utah, I was a graduate student at the University of Utah, and I was there at the same time as the poet Larry Levis. And um, poetry's always been really deeply important to me and to my work. And, and uh, my close friends say this book is my ode to Larry Levis because of the way he, his poems kind of roll like this book. Like there's just the, the, all of a sudden you're talking about an owl and then that owl takes you to 1976 and then that 1976 takes you to Stone Harbor, New Jersey. And you know, it, it's the way he associates, I learned from him at Utah and that, that's how this book is made. But lots and lots of other books, but there's like four. Laurie Moore's book, Anagrams, which is another early book of hers, I just adore and could practically can recite. One more, or should we call it good? There's Nick, the ticking is the bomb. <laughs> All right, well, thank you so much for being here. Thank you.